uh, it's always a pleasure for me to be here in Italy. Uh, I have a lot of scientific collaborators here in this country. I like the weather, I like the food, so it's, uh, if I were an American I would say, well, this is the best country of the world. But I'm not an American, so it's one of the best countries. The best country in the world is Belgium, where my friend Kevin Braun is coming from. And the reason is there they have the best beers. Um, what I'd like to discuss with you today is the work we are doing in Utrecht for now for 10 years on polymeric micelles for drug delivery. And the work I'm going to present to you today is essentially done by two of our PhD students. Uh, they both finished uh, one, two years finished in 2011, 2012, so it's Marina Talelli and uh, Bart Krilaat. And this project, their work was done in the framework of a Euro European project, Meditrans, and that was focused on targeted delivery of uh, pharmaceuticals. And that program was run by uh, Gert Storm and uh, Twan Lammers, and they were heavily involved in this uh, project as well. Well, blockopolymer polymeric micelles. There's one of the, uh, is the, if they are called now, 20 years ago we talked about them as particulate or colloidal. Uh, particles for drug delivery at present we call them nanomedicines and one of these nanomedicines are uh, po polymeric micelles. I think the concept was already uh, introduced uh, yesterday by the last speaker, Emanuela, and uh, polymeric micelles, well, uh, schematically shown here, they consist of uh, amphiphilic blockopolymers, so blockopolymers, which are uh, polymers with a hydrophilic block, mostly polyethylene glycol, and a hydrophobic block. And if you put them in water, just as classical micelles, they self-assemble into a nanostructure, a micellar structure. And these structures are composed of a hydrophobic core and a hydrophilic shell, and in that way these particles are stable in aqueous solutions. And the nice feature of these uh, polymeric micelles is that they are small, uh, depending on the size of the blocks of the polymer, uh, the way you prepare the micelles, you can make micelles from, uh, to, uh, from 10 to around 100 nanometers. Uh, because of the pest shell, they can have a long circulation in the bloodstream, I will come to that later. And uh, by that they accumulate in tumor tissues and importantly the hydrophobic core of this micellar system can be used to solubilize hydrophobic drugs. So they have a lot of attractive features for drug delivery purposes. A little bit about uh, uh, drug targeting. I think it was already also mentioned yesterday by uh, Professor Kranz as well as uh, Kabitson, Professor Kabitson. Um, we distinguish in the drug delivery field passive targeting and active targeting. Well, passive targeting is characterized, well, here we have a tumor, and in principle, the vasculature surrounding the tumor or in the tumor are leaky. So there are holes between the endothelial cell layers, and because of that, particles can penetrate through these holes and accumulate into the tumor. And this is called passive targeting. We can go one step further, we can decorate the particle, that can also valid for albumin particles or for liposomes or other nanomedicine, with targeting ligands, and these targeting ligands are specific, you aim them to make them specific for instance for tumor cells. And if you allow me, I want to make two, two remarks about these uh, targeting concepts. The good thing is, uh, if we look at drug delivery, drug targeting field, that field is maturing. More researchers are entering this field. Uh, and you see now at present a lot of papers in highly ranked journals and, and around 10 years ago, 20 years ago, people worked on liposomes, lipid-based system, uh, polymeric system. But now you see carbon nanotubes, you see silica particles, you see quantum dots, all kinds of other particles entering the field, that's okay. Uh, but if you then look at the papers that people write, they do not really understand the concept of targeting. Because the first misunderstanding they have is passive targeting, that the EPR effect is a kind of sponge. So the whole dose is going to the tumor due to the EPR effect. That's a misunderstanding. If we, if we do a proper job and uh, 5 to 10 percent of the dose actually enters the tumor, then we are doing a good job. So we should realize that 90 percent or probably even more of the dose of the drug is still going to other sites in the body. And Professor Garbison pointed out yesterday one of the very unexpected things we encountered with these uh, liposomal systems, doxil, that they enter into the skin where they give that head and foot syndrome. So that's an unexpected uh, experience due to the, yeah, we playing in fact with nanomedicines, we playing with the pharmacokinetics and the biodistribution of the drugs. 
The other misunderstanding is, uh, well, the other thing, I think, as Professor Garbison pointed it out, in animal models, EPR works quite well, because there we are impatient, we work with tumor models that rapidly grow. So uh, in one, two weeks, we have a tumor there, and these tumors are almost always very leaky. But in patients, it's very debatable uh, whether uh, EPR also works there, because in patients, the tumor more normally grow quite slowly, and it's really the question whether, whether the EPR is as well developed there as in, uh, as in, uh, in uh, animal models. So this is the one misunderstanding of passive targeting. When we have a look at active targeting, then you can read it in many papers, if they see some kind of effect with a particulate system, with a drug that kills a cancer or cancer cell, then they say, okay, the next step is, we are now going to couple a targeting ligand to the system, and then we hope and we expect to increase the therapeutic efficacy. The misunderstanding is, if you look at intravenous administration, the amount of drug that is coming in the tumor uh, is dependent on the area under the curve. So the plasma concentration uh, time curve. And if we do active targeting, what can happen that due to the fact that we modify the surface of the particle, that in fact the AUC becomes smaller. So in fact less drug actually enters the tumor compared to a passively targeted system. And also for drugs, many drugs simply come into a cell by passive diffusion, and therefore active targeting is not, not an option, is not necessary. So we need active targeting when the drug has to be uh, present intracellularly and does not spontaneously pass cellular membranes. And it's quite obvious, for instance, for the modern generation of nucleic acid-based drugs, they need to be delivered intracellularly, and therefore targeting, active targeting, is really an option. Okay, so there's some background and some lessons about targeting principles. Let's go back to the polymeric micelles. But I mentioned that uh, polymeric micelles are composed of uh, amphiphilic block of polymers, a uh, hydrophilic block and a hydrophobic block, and a very special class of polymeric micelles are made of thermosensitive polymers. And thermosensitive polymers are polymers with very unique aqueous solution properties, so they are soluble in water below a certain temperature, and they precipitate above the temperature that's often referred to the cloud point or the lower critical solution temperature. <coughs> and a very well-known polymer in the drug delivery and the biomedical research field is polynipem, poly anisopropyl acryl amide. Structure is shown here, very simple polymer, uh, below 32 degrees. It's hydrophilic, so if you have polynipem, independent of the molecular weight, it dissolves in water below 32 degrees. If you then heat the solution above 32 degrees, it becomes hydrophobic. And the reason is that below 32 degrees, water molecules interact with these amide bonds. So in that sense, the polymer is solubilized, but above 32 degrees, these interactions are becoming weaker, and the isopropyl, hydrophobic isopropyl group take over the char characteristics of the, of the polymer, and the polymer becomes hydrophobic. Okay, if you then make a block of polymer of polyethylene glycol and polynipem, and you uh, bring them in aqueous solution, a temperature below the cloud point, below the 32 degrees, then you have in the solution, you have uni unimers. So both polynipem uh, is water soluble as well as polyethylene glycol. So you end with a polymer solution, uh, an aqueous polymer solution. If you then bring it to body temperature, to 37 degrees, then it's hydrophobic. These polynipem blocks becomes hydrophobic. And in fact, we then have a classical polymeric micelle that is self-assembled into this micellar uh, structure. So what is the advantage of this system? That uh, The advantage is that by simply heating the polymer solution, you can make the micellar system. If you have the classical polymeric micelle with a uh, hydrophobic block and a hydrophilic block, you have to use organic solvents and other tricks to make these micelles, but here you simply can do that in, a, in an all aqueous system. But the drawback of the, this system is that uh, the polynipem is non-degradable, so that you really have to take into consideration. So it's a good model polymer, but probably the practical applicability is limited. And uh, it's also questionable, if you put the drug in, how is the drug being released from this system? So that's by, more or less by accident, we uh, developed a new 
uh, thermosensitive polymer. Uh, and that, in contrast to uh, polynipem, this is a degradable polymer. So we published that uh, some 10 years ago in biomarker molecules, and the structure is shown here. So it is a backbone of uh, poly-HPMA, hydroxypropyl mesocryl amide, and this polymer is quite known in the drug delivery field by the papers of uh, Kopicek and Duncan, where they use this polymer for uh, coupling doxorubicin and making, uh, well, one of the first uh, nanomedicines that went to uh, clinical trials. Uh, this polymer has a hydroxyl group, secondary hydroxyl group, and we couple to that lactic acid units. We can couple one or two or even more, but the most uh, research we did with the polymer that has either one or two lactic acid uh, side chains. And the nice feature of this uh, system is that uh, poly-HPMA is fully water-soluble, but once we derivatize it with lactic acid groups, the polymer becomes thermosensitive. <laughs> And in contrast to polynipem, which has a fixed cloud point of 32 degrees, we can now play with the cloud point uh, or the uh, LCST transition temperature. And we can do that with the uh, uh, side chain group composition in this polymer. So if, if you make a polymer that only has per, per group one lactic acid unit, so it's the monolactate, then we end up with a fully soluble uh, polymer below 62 degrees and above this temperature it, uh, the polymer precipitates. On the other hand, if we make the polymer with only the dielectate, then it's soluble below 10 degrees uh, centigrade and above 10 degrees centigrade it is insoluble. And by making polymers with different copolymer composition, we can titrate the cloud point of the polymer. One of the other attractive features is that uh, because this uh, lactic acid uh, groups are coupled via ester bonds, and these ester bonds are degradable under physiological conditions. So then in time, if we start with a polymer that only has uh, two lactic acid side chains, in time the composition is going into this direction. So originally if we have a system that uh, uh, has only two lactic acid groups, so then we have a system at 37 degrees that's insoluble, but in time, the composition is shifting into this direction. And at a certain stage, when enough lactic acid groups are hydrolyzed off, we end up with a system that is soluble. So in time, we, come, we have a system that's originally insoluble, and in time, due to hydrolysis, it becomes soluble. And if we then have the polymer backbone to such an extent that is uh, below the renal filtration range, then the polymer can be excreted by the kidneys. So the question is, can we now make, oh, I want to go back here once again. So uh, here again is the uh, uh, thermosensitivity shown. So we have a system at 25 degrees that's really a homogeneous solution. If we increase the temperature to 37 degrees, it becomes cloudy. But if you have a closer look at these particles, these particles are a um, couple of micrometers. So not very suitable for intravenous uh, drug delivery. So to make smaller systems, smaller particles, we synthesize block of polymers of uh, the HPMA lactide together with uh, polyethylene glycol. So this is polyethylene glycol macroinitiator. Uh, this can undergo uh, 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 radical polymerization. And if we do that, we end up with a diblocal polymer of polyethylene glycol and our thermosensitive poly-HPMA lactate uh, polymer. So the question is, does this uh, polymer for micelles. We did dynamic light scattering measurements, but we also did visualization by electron microscopy. And here I have the uh, cryo-EM results. And you see that these particles really are uh, spherically uh, shaped particles with a size between 25 and 50 nanometers. And we found the same sizes with dynamic light scattering. Going back to the degradability of the system. So here we have the uh, uh, micelles uh, with uh, 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 HPMA pack, HPMA dielectate, so it has a cloud point of 10 degrees, so at 37 degrees it forms micelles. If you put that at uh, 37 degrees in the dynamic light scattering machine and we measure the size in time, then, uh, well, over the weekend, 60 hours, 
we see that the size remains constant as well as the scattering intensity. So that means that these particles do not degrade and have a very excellent colloidal stability. And the reason is that at pH 5, these ester bonds are not sensitive for hydrolysis. So the uh, hydrolysis of ester bonds at pH 5 is minimal. And it's really reflecting this picture. Become another story. When we incubate these micelles at uh, pH 9, of course we should do it at the pH 7, but pH 9 we can accelerate the process. And here we see two things that due to the uh, hydrolysis of the electric acid change, the polymer undergoes a tra transformation from insoluble to soluble, and that's exactly what we see here. So here, if we incubate these micelles, originally they have a size of 50 nanometers, and if you incubate them then at 37 degrees and it's pH 9, then we see an increase in size and then this time uh, in scattering intensity and then the scattering intensity drops. Sorry, this is the scattering intensity plot. So it increases because the particles swell and then the particles destabilize and the DLS signal uh, drops. So at this point, the micelles were fully converted into soluble polymer chains. Well, the question is, our body is not pH 9, can we translate it to pH 7? Well, this hydrolysis is prim uh, primarily driven by hydroxyl ions, uh, so it's a factor almost uh, 20 at uh, between pH 9 and pH 7.4, and we also check that and uh, uh, these micelles destabilize in uh, pH 9 at around 3 hours and around 160 hours at pH 7.4. So this is a nice starting point for further investigation. And uh, well, we, we took a simple or simple, well-known uh, cytostatic drug, Pactitaxel. The structure is shown here. It's a very hydrophobic drug. Uh, solubility is less than one microgram uh, per ml in, uh, in water. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, uh, this Pactitaxel is presently used in clinical practice. <coughs> Uh, but then it's solubilized into a mixture of cremophore and ethanol, so surfactants and ethanol to solubilize this drug. But this formulation is associated with some severe side effects. So this uh, structure is very well suitable because of its uh, hydrophobicity to uh, solubilize into the uh, micellar structures. And that's indeed what we see. Well, here we see the data uh, the table, but probably for a presentation more. It's nicer to show the, uh, how it does look like. So if we take a solution of Pactitaxel and polyethylene glycol, then we end up with huge precipitates. On the other hand, if we solubilize it in the micelles, then we end up, well, you see here a very nice micellar dispersion. And uh, well, we optimize the formulation and by playing with the uh, uh, preparation conditions, we can make formulations in which the concentration of Pactitaxel is more than 1,000 fold higher than in water. Okay, then the next step is we did some cell studies and we checked whether these micelles uh, are safe or have a good site compatibility and the same with the Pactitaxel uh, loaded ones. Uh, and then uh, the next step was uh, to go to, uh, to an in vivo study. So this was the very simple setup. So we have the micellar formulation and a low, high dose and a low dose. Of course, we also checked the empty micelles and we compare that with the same dose of the standard formulation of Pactitaxel and of course we have a, a saline control. So we induce the tumor and then after when the tumors in the animals, in the mice have a certain size, we started with the therapy. And the results are shown here. Uh, this is the PBS control, so rapid growth of the tumor. This is the, um, uh, the, the Pactitaxel either in the Taxol formulation or in the polymeric micellar formulation of the low dose, and this same for the high dose. And of course we see a therapeutic effect, but it was a little bit disappointed that we did not see we were aiming for a better effect with these micelles due to EPR effect and things I explained before. But it turned out that the uh, therapeutic efficacy of, of Pactitaxel in the classical formulation, the cream of four formulation, and the micellar formulation was the same. So, what to do next? Well, we were thinking, um, uh, what can happen? These micelles that I showed you, in aqueous dispersion, they are quite stable. But we should realize that if we inject them, um, we have always, we have a uh, dynamic micelles are dynamic systems, so they are in equilibrium with unimers, very low concentration, but they are always there. And if you have inject them into the bloodstream, you dilute them, but you also in the bloodstream you have plasma proteins present. And what might happen that plasma proteins like lipoproteins or albumin might interact with these unimers, and in that sense you have a shift in equilibrium, and you destabilize your micelles. 
Well, then if this is the hypothesis, what is then the way to circumvent that, to circumvent this dynamic equilibrium? Then uh, question how to prevent destabilization, and then one of the approaches is to cross-link the core of these micelles, to, to bring covalent linkages between the hydrophobic blocks of these micelles. In that sense, this equilibrium does not exist anymore, and the micelles remain stable into the circulation. So that was the hypothesis. Does it work? Well, first, a little bit of chemistry. How did we do that? Here again, I have the structure of the polymer. Here you have the lactic acid groups, and we have an additional hydroxyl group that's with which we can do a lot of chemistry. And the chemistry we applied is we uh, react this hydroxyl group, part of the hydroxyl group is either mesocryl chloride or the anhydride, and then we introduce an extra polymerizable group, a side chain into the polymer structure. Uh, and this, sorry, and this side group can be further polymerized by which uh, 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 crosslinks are introduced between the hydrophobic blocks. Well, do we then get a better circulation kinetics? So here we, so this is just a, form, a, a kinetic study, so we only look at the uh, circulation kinetics of the particles. And we did it in animals that, uh, were, uh, that have tumors, so we did not look at therapeutic efficacy, that will come later, but we only looked at the, uh, the, uh, by this, the, uh, the circulation kinetics and the biodistribution. So if we look at the plasma concentration of the uh, polymeric micelles, so this is the, the uh, uh, red squares are the non-crosslinked micelles, and uh, we see that uh, yeah, in one hour, less than 10% of the original dose is in the circulation. So the remaining uh, is uh, excreted probably by the, by the kidneys. On the other hand, if we cross-link the micelles, then we end up with a long circulating particle. And this is, well, if you're familiar, familiar with the literature, this is around the same circulation kinetics you have with uh, uh, classical uh, pegylated uh, liposomes. So here we have a kind of, as it's called, a stealth particle. If we then look at the uh, tumor accumulation, so this is the non-crossing micelles, then some of the dose is entering, but you see a rapid excretion elimination from the tumor of the non-crossing micelles, so they don't stay there. On the other hand, the core crosslinked ones, uh, you have 5% of the dose per gram of tumor accumulates in the tumor. Well, you might argue at time five minutes, uh, one hour already 5%, but probably in this stage, a lot of the dose is still in circulation, and if you take the tumor out, there's also a lot of blood there, so probably this is an overestimation of the amount that's really in the tumor. But after 48 hours, hardly any micelles circulate anymore, so this is really the amount of the micelles <coughs> that accumulate into the tumor. Next step is to do a uh, efficacy study, a therapeutic efficacy study, again with the packet cell, but again we had disappointing results in the sense that we do not see a better therapeutic efficacy. So we did a further kinetic study in which we uh, took uh, carbon-14 labeled uh, packet cell. And uh, we checked the pharmacokinetics in uh, core crossing micelles, non crossing micelles, and also the classical the, uh, clinical formulation of paclitaxel in cremaphore. And we see that both, if you look at the uh, uh, circulation kinetics of the free drug, of the drug in the uh, micelles, non crossing micelles, and taxol, you see a very rapid elimination. Uh, due to the fact uh, destabilization of the micelles, what I explained. But also to our surprise and a little bit disappointed, uh, disappointment, uh, the core closing micelles, they have better circulation kinetics than the, uh, than the other formulation, but it was not very impressive. And already after eight hours, less than 2% of the dose was in the, uh, the circulation, and at one hour only uh, around 5% of the drug. And probably the reason is that although we have now a crossing particle that circulates long, the, my, the drug is, uh, uh, can still diffuse out of the micelles, can be diluted and executed via the, the, the kidneys. So uh, cross-linking of the micelles, the summary, uh, is uh, good for circulation kinetics of the particle, but only marginally affects the circulation kinetics uh, and the pharmacokinetics of the entrapped drug. So the question is then how to circumvent that, and uh, again, the solution is what you can imagine, uh, uh, what we, what 
what I discussed before, that's also coupled the drug now to the core of the po polymer micelle. We come in contact with uh, Professor Carl Ulbricht from Prague University, not the University of Ma Institute of Macromolecular Science, and he developed this pro-drug of uh, doxorubicin. So this is the well-known uh, anti-cancer drug doxorubicin, and here we uh, and he uh, introduced the polymerizable group to this, uh, coupled to the uh, uh, doxorubicin molecule. And the nice feature of this, uh, the chemistry he used, is that he used a hydrazon bond. And this hydrazon bond is stable at pH 7, so it's stable in the circulation, but it's degraded, it undergoes hydrolysis at pH 5. And the reason, I, and why pH 5, why is that important? Well, firstly, the pH in tumors is more acidic, is lower, than in the, in the circulation, so that can accelerate the, uh, the, uh, the release of the drug. And the other thing is, if we de design a particle that's uh, taken up by tumor cells, then mostly it's taken up by endocytosis, and then it ends up into the endosome, which has a low pH. So then we have release of this drug into the endosome. So we uh, made these micelles with this covalently linked uh, doxorubicin. And we measured the release at pH 5 and pH 7, and uh, Professor Uber did a very good job, and indeed had the end of release at pH 5, at 7, but in uh, around 24 hours, almost a complete dose was released at pH 5. So there's really a encouraging results to go, to go further. Well, we looked at in vitro cytotoxicity toxicity uh, in ovarian carcinoma cells, so this is the free dox, it's a typical, uh, uh, typical curve. This was the mesaculated doxorubicin, so there's hardly, so it's, uh, uh, the difference looks small. In fact, it's a log 10 difference in uh, IC50 values, and the reason is that the mesaculated doxorubicin probably enters the cell, but by free diffusion, uh, but does not enter into the endosome. So there, uh, that's why I can explain this uh, large difference inside the toxicity. However, if you have the micelles, then uh, we do not have the, good, the, the same efficacy as the free doxorubicin, but we have a better efficacy than the doxime. So that really uh, gives uh, support to the hypothesis that the particles are taken up by endocytosis end up in the endosome where the drug is released. Okay, this was then a nice result for to continue. Uh, in a uh, therapeutic efficacy study, again, a very simple experiment. So we have uh, mice that uh, carrying a, a tumor, uh, IV injection of the nanomedicine formulation. So we have, again, three uh, 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 groups, the doxorubicin micelles, the free doxorubicin, and the PBS control. And, and this, the readout is very simple. You look at tumor growth, or if we are interested in the efficacy, we look at tumor growth inhibition. So what do we see? We see a, uh, uh, this is the PBS control, so it's a very aggressive tumor, as you can see, so it really grows out rapidly. Uh, doxorubicin uh, gives uh, uh, retardation of the growth, and the micellar formulation does a better job, but uh, uh, it's not, still not very, very uh, impressive. So we do have a better effect, but again, we were aiming for, uh, uh, for a better efficacy. So the question is then, well, I come back now to the active targeting, and I mentioned that uh, active targeting is useful for uh, drugs that do not uh, spontaneously come into this, the target cell, but doxorubicin freely diffuses from the uh, extracellular space into the tumor cell by, uh, by diffusion. So for doxorubicin, there is no need for a targeted system, but what we selected, we selected a uh, targeting ligand that as such has intrinsic activity uh, anti-tumor activity, and I will explain a little bit more. So what we did, uh, we selected a so-called nanobody. Probably you're not familiar with nanobodies, but nanobodies are uh, the uh, uh, binding sites of immunoglobulins, uh, IgG molecules from a specific class of uh, mammals, uh, camelids. And it was discovered some 20 years ago that, well, this is the classical structure of a uh, IgG molecule with the heavy chain and the light chain. But it was, oh, sorry, this is the classical structure of a, uh, of a IgG molecule, a heavy chain and, uh, and a light chain. But it was discovered some 20 years ago that these camelids uh, have IgG molecules that are composed of uh, heavy chain only. And if you now take the uh, uh, site or the, 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 the part of the molecule that's responsible for recognition of the antigen, that's called the nanobody. So this tip of this IgG molecule is the nanobody. And they have advantages above 
uh, classical uh, uh, IgG molecules, they are smaller, uh, they, have a better they have better pharmaceutical properties, so they are more stable, so they're more easy to handle. So in that sense, these nanobodies are attractive molecules to use them as uh, uh, targeting ligands. What we selected, we selected a nanobody against the EGFR receptor, so the epidermal growth factor receptor. And this EGFR receptor is involved in the tumor, in tumor growth. It's upregulated in many tumor cells, and it's also known that if you block this EGFR receptor, that also the tumor growth is slowed down. So if we have now an antibody selected for the EGFR receptor and we bind it, that's demonstrated in other papers, then tumor growth is inhibited. So we have now a combination of an actively targeted particle that contains a therapeutic drug as well as the targeting ligand as such has intrinsic therapeutic effects. So was that reality? So this is a little bit of chemistry we used. So we have the uh, polymeric micelles with uh, PDP groups, a blocked tile group. In the protein, in the nanobody, we introduced a also a blocked tile group, but with hydroxyl amine and EDTA, you can uh, deprotect this group, so that you end up with a protein with a uh, tile group, and that can be exchanged with the pyridyl group here, and then you get a particle to which the nanobody is covalent linked. Uh, one of the concerns is if you do this type of chemistry and you couple it via the, the nanobody is coupled to the micelles via an amine, and it is, the na uh, amine is involved in the binding of the uh, nanobody to the receptor, then you have a very well, you have coupled the nanobody to the, uh, to the micelle, but the uh, affinity for the receptor is gone. So to check if that's the case or not the case, we did binding studies in cells, so there is facts analysis and this is the result, so this is a uh, non-targeted micelles lacking the nanobody, and these are the targeted ones, and we see a very nice dose responsiveness of the number of particles that are taken up by the cells. So that indeed shows that the nanobody is still able to be taken up by the cells. Well, again, this is the, we checked again the release of PH7 and PH5, well, and as, as expected, the nanobody as such does not affect the release uh, kinetics. Then the next step was, of course, to go for a uh, therapeutic efficacy study. So here again, we have a, a tumor model in mice. When they have a certain size, we started with the therapy, and uh, we looked at uh, the growth of the tumor. So again, we have a uh, 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 number of groups. So first, we have the, uh, the free doxorubicin, and this is around the MTD, the maximum tol uh, tolerated dose. So we have the dox uh, micelles with the same uh, uh, dose as the free dox, but we also anticipated a better MTD, so better tolerability of the formulation. So we also checked a higher uh, f uh, uh, dose. And we did the same, so these are the non-targeted, non, uh, the uh, actively targeted micelles. These are the ones with the nanobodies, so that bind to the tumor cells, the same dose as the free micelles. We also checked the efficacy of the free micelles, of the micelles with the uh, uh, nanobody coupled to it. And of course, we had the PBS control. Well, this is the low dose group, so this is the PBS control. So we administer the formulation at different time points. And this is the, uh, 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 both the free doxorubicin uh, that has certain activity as well as the empty micelles with the nanobody. And again, the nanobody, when it binds to the EGFR receptor, uh, the tumor growth is, uh, is inhib in in inhibited because of you block, you block the, uh, the, uh, the receptor. What about the doxorubicin formulations? So this is the formulation, uh, doxorubicin formulation, the non-actively targeted one. So it's lacking the nanobody, and this is the formulation with the nanobody. And we see a better therapeutic efficacy of the formulation with the uh, uh, nanobody. So we see, in other words, we see a synergistic effect between the fact that we have a, uh, the doxorubicin there as well as the nanobody that blocks the receptor. What about the high dose? So we could not do a control group with the free doxorubicin because we have a too high concentration, we pass the MTD. But uh, with the formulations, we could administer these, uh, uh, these uh, high doses without, in the short term, of course, you didn't look at long-term toxicity, but in short term, there were no toxic effects observed, systemic to toxic uh, effects. But we do see a very good tumor re regression in time. And if we look at this Kaplan, 
plot, we have a better survival of the formulation with the nanobody than with the non-targeted formulation. So that really shows that uh, this targeted formulation has a very good anti-tumor activity. Well, the last five minutes of my presentation, uh, I want to spend, uh, I want to show you some uh, recent data uh, uh, of Bart Metzelaar, Bart Krilaert, about uh, targeting of corticosteroids. Uh, again, if you look at literature and you look at targeted nanomedicine, then the, I think more than 80%, probably 90% of the papers are dealing with targeting tumors. But there are certainly also other diseases that might benefit from targeted delivery. And essentially that are diseases that are characterized by an EPR, uh, the enhanced permeation and retention effect. Well, for tumors it has been published, but it's also known, and essentially in all kinds of pathologies where inflammation is going on, the vasculature is changing and the vasculature becomes permeable. And the other disease uh, where we uh, uh, tried our formulation for is uh, characterized by EPR, by inflammation, that's arthritis. So that's the inflammation of the joints, terrible disease, many people suffer from that. Uh, and these patients uh, uh, mostly undergo chemotherapy with corticosteroids. And these corticosteroids are powerful drugs, but they are also associated with very severe side effects. And here uh, I show you three drugs. Well, this is the chemistry. If you're interested, I can send you the paper where we published it. But in the next slide, the structure are pointed out bigger, so you can bet better see what we did. So this is the corticosteroid. We used the same corticosteroid. Again, we have a polymerizable group to incorporate it, to bind it to the uh, core of the micelles. But the, the things we changed between the polymerizable group and the corticosteroid, we have an ester bond. So the ester bond is susceptible for hydrolysis. So in that way, the drug is, by hydrolysis, is released into the uh, pathological tissue. But this ester, in the vicinity of this ester, we have uh, introduced the sulfur atom. And this sulfur atom, we have either it as the sulfide of the, uh, the, the sulfoxide or the sulfon, so with one oxygen or two oxygens. And what we then do in an organic chemistry way is that by introducing, by playing with the state of oxidation of the sulfur atom, we make this ester bond more susceptible for hydrolytic, uh, 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 for, for hydrolysis. And the reason is that hydrolysis of esters, the first step, lessons of organic chemistry of the first year, the first step that occurs is uh, attack of a hydroxyl ion on this carbonyl bond. So here we have a delta plus, and the hydroxyl ion attacks and gives an attack on that. But if you play with the state of oxidation, in fact, we are playing with the, uh, the delta plus charge at this carbon atom. So if we have more oxidation, this carbon atom becomes more positively charged and easier, uh, easier attack of these hydroxyl ions. So to show that's really the case, we checked the, uh, the hydrolysis kinetics. So here we have the three spacers. This is the sulfide, the sulfoxide, and the sulfon, and this is no uh, oxidation on the sulfur. One oxygen atom, two oxygen atoms, and you, you indeed see that our hypothesis that with the state of oxidation of the sulfur, we can uh, play with the hydrolysis kinetics of the, uh, the corticosteroid. And uh, well, if you now look at 150 hours, that's around seven days, 40% of the corticosteroid is released. So for further uh, in vivo evaluation, we use the uh, uh, sulfon uh, 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 prodrug of the corticosteroid. So we checked it in two models. Uh, in a mice model, this is more representative for uh, uh, acute arthritis, and we have a red model that's more representative for chronic arthritis. I will, we, we had about the same result, but I only showed the results we, we, we obtained with this model. Uh, so what you do, you introduce the inflammation in joints, and then if you do therapy, uh, there are a number of things you can measure, but one of the easiest things you can measure is to measure the swelling of the joints. And that's done on a scale of one to, uh, to four, and that's done in four individual animals. So that means that if there's no swelling, the swelling is zero, and if there's yeah, the severe disease, the swelling is, is 16. So the scale is from one to 16. So this is the, the result. So this is the animal in which we introduce the disease, and then you see that uh, in time the swelling uh, uh, develops, uh, and uh, to, to a certain extent, in, uh, in, and it does not go back to baseline levels. 
So this is the PBS control. So this is the formulation, this is the group of animals that receive the free corticosteroid. So and you see that uh, you have a drop in the swelling, so the drug does its action, but after a certain time the, uh, the drug is eliminated and the swelling comes back. On the other hand, with the targeted formulation, we see that uh, we have uh, a uh, drop in the, uh, the swelling of the, uh, the joints and that lasted for more than 25 days. So that really shows this one, this one single injection, I should stress that, is sufficient to suppress the swelling of the joints for, uh, for uh, more than three weeks. You can imagine that, uh, well, for real therapy, these patients have to go uh, yeah, chronic therapy, so this is uh, probably a formulation suitable to administer one per month to the patients. Of course, this is just a start of the development, and we are now looking at further uh, animal models and further studies whether we can find similar effects there. So finally, we bring you to the conclusion. Uh, I hope that I've shown you that these core crossing mice are very attractive nanomedicines for targeted delivery. And we have very promising therapeutic effects with doxorubicin and dexamethasone. And these are the sponsors of the work. work. And what I finally like to, to stress, Professor Calicetti mentioned yesterday in the introduction that one of the aims of your uh, group here is to also work on translational aspects of, uh, of drug delivery research. And in our university, we have now a spin-off company who is now bringing these uh, formulations to, uh, to clinical uh, evaluation, hopefully uh, next year. And having said that, I'd like to thank again the organizer for the invitation. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm open to answer questions. Thank you, Professor Hennig, for the very interesting uh, talk. The paper is open.